Good evening and welcome all of you to our Monday Thursday meditation um, as, here at Our Savior Lutheran in Issaquah. This is a simple, quiet evening. It's an opportunity for us to enter into the three days and remember those last days of the life on this earth of Jesus um, and the one who is raised on Easter and to contemplate how that life ended. On the Thursday of his life, he gathers with his disciples uh, to share a meal and to um, give them some final teachings about who he is and what his life has been about. The term Monday um, gives us the word, the English word, mandate. And it's based on the, the idea that on this night, Jesus gave his disciples and us a new commandment, a commandment of love, a deep kind of love that we really have to work at to really understand and live out that commandment. And so that's what we're about tonight, just to think about Jesus' work and his words and to um, get started on our three days journey to the cross and resurrection. On Ash Wednesday, we heard an extensive confession of our sins, and in a sense, that confession has been in suspense for these five and a half weeks. And so here we hear a more, more complete word of forgiveness for your lives. So let us hear this prayer of confession. Dear friends in Christ, in this Lenten season, we have heard our Lord's call to struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that makes us, all that keeps us from loving God and each other. This is the struggle to which we were called in baptism. Yet within the community of the church, God never wearies of forgiving sin and giving the peace of reconciliation. So on this night, let us confess our sin against God and our neighbor and enter into the celebration of the great three days, reconciled with God and reconciled with one another. Pray with me. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By God's grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with the power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. And now we hear these words of Jesus to his disciples at that last meal. This is John chapter 13. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had put into the heart of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a, a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around them, around him. He came to Simon Peter and said to him, and Simon said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? 
And Jesus answered, you do not know what I am doing, but later you will understand. And Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. And Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but it is entirely clean. And you are clean, though all, not all of you, for he knew who was to betray him. And for this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you, as an, as, I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly I tell you, servants are no greater than their master, nor are masters greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. In the summer of 1981, a long time ago, 40 years ago almost, I was serving my CPE, that stands for Clinical Pastoral Education. It's a unit that was required after or before you could serve as a pastor. And we got a call in the chaplain's office from the nursing station on third floor south. Uh, this was uh, at the St. Louis Children's Hospital, so these were all kids. And, and the nurse said that a fight had broken out in a room on her floor between two nine-year-old boys. And could the chaplain come and help out and see what was going on? And so if you are, um, and so if you understand that Children who come to a children's hospital are very sick. And even if they are nine years old, and even if you're full of all kinds of energy, you still, and you might be also filled with drugs that um, keep you from being focused, keep you from being able to be at full strength. And so I answered the call. And I knew almost immediately when I came into the room that something was wrong. It was a large room, the kind of room that usually had at least four beds, maybe even six, but there were only two beds, uh, two boys on far opposite walls from each other. And the room was filled. All the floor was a mess. It had, it had stuffed animals and it had um, toys. It had books. It had a couple of um, containers of Kleenex. I think those boys had grabbed everything they could reach and tried to throw it at each other, but in their state, I think most of it fell short. Most of it did no, didn't get past the middle of the room. They were doing the best they could to get into a fight, and it had been a valiant effort. I realized almost immediately that this was a situation that was suited more for maybe a very good babysitter or um, a fourth grade teacher of some kind. It really, they didn't really need a, 
spiritual guide in that room at that time, but I brought what I had. I pushed a few stuffed animals to the side and pulled a chair from the side of the door and sat down in the middle of the room and I said, what's going on? And for the next 45 minutes or so, back and forth, I heard in no, nobody really taking their own turns, just kind of at first shouting down each other, and then as I refereed, sort of getting the story out, what was going on. And then we just sat there and talked. Benji, uh, one of the boys, was um, in a cast hard plaster cast from his chest all the way down to his toes sticking out. There was a, about a two-foot rod that had been plastered in between his knees to keep his, knee, to keep his hips in place, I think. Benji was from a tough part of St. Louis, and he, for a nine-year-old, he was pretty tough all by himself. And he, he and his friends had found a shopping cart and they were taking turns, pushing it around, and I guess having a race. And He was in the cart when one of the boys lost control, and it went out into the street, and he got hit by a car, and had been pretty smashed up. So the, 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 um, all the attachments around him, the contraptions around him, actually had his legs up in the air, higher than his hips, I guess it helped with circulation. And that's where he, that was his fighting pose, that's where he spent his days and nights, day after day in that position. Benji was a friendly, gregarious young man. He was uh, more than happy to tell me about uh, all that had happened to him, all, <laughs> all the bones, all the crunching he felt, all the twistedness in his body. I had heard enough after a couple of sentences, but I still listed, listened. I thought it would build some trust and open him up. John, the other boy, was from the suburbs, and he had been in, uh, in the hospital off and on since he was five years old with various kinds of serious illnesses, and now in these days his, uh, he had kidney failure. He was um, worried about that seriousness, his he was bloated with dialysis and with the steroids you have to take in those situations. He was weak not from being tied down, but he was weak from being um, in that position, from being more in bed than, above, than up and around in his life. Because of the life that John lived, combined with his uh, natural personality, he was more quiet, more moody, more prone to selfishness, and less likely to be persuaded to some kind of compromise. He was not immediately as likable as Benji, and, but you couldn't help to love him for the courage that he had used in those years to stay alive, to keep going. I can't remember 40 years later uh, what it was they were fighting about, and I don't really think it matters what they were fighting about. The chances are it was the same kind of thing that nine-year-old boys always get into skirmishes about. He's looking at me funny, I think one of them said, and the other said he said something that made me mad, so I, so I threw something at him. Whatever it was, it didn't really matter. Given their situation in life, it's not like they were really going to hurt each other. And Rather than being a cause for alarm or intervention, their argument was actually a good sign. It was a sign of life. It was a sign of caring. It was a sign of hope. They cared enough to fight for life. It was, of course, the brokenness of their lives. The fact that they were, they were broken and away from their family, away from their friends away from their communities. It was the brokenness that had brought them into this room together in the first place. They never would have otherwise crossed paths. They would have never known each other in this world. But it was also the brokenness that in their lives that kept them from hurting each other, that kept them from going after each other and finally, 
finally getting the revenge or whatever it was that they wanted, they had to, they had to work it out because their lives were broken. It was the brokenness in the lives of the disciples of Jesus, those who were there on that night, but also those who follow the disciples of today, our own brokenness that forces us out of our personal lives, out of our families, out of our communities, out of daily life, and brings us together um, in this evening, whether it's by the video or whether it's those years when we can gather together, we come out of the lives and we are rubbing shoulders with people who we would otherwise have no cause to be in a relationship with. It's our brokenness that's brought us to this place. But it's also our brokenness, the brokenness of the disciples that forces Jesus to give them a commandment to stop fighting, to set aside their differences, to love one another to care for one another deeply and to let that be the most important thing between them. It is perhaps both the saddest commentary there is on how far God's people, that how far God's intentions for creation has fallen that such a commandment is necessary, but it's also the greatest hope for healing that Jesus says to his closest friends, I give you this commandment that you love one another, that this is the most important way to live, that this is the thing that is on, your front, on the front of your mind most often. Just as I have loved you, you should love one another. You would think it would go without saying, but there it is. And we are convicted and we are confined by the power of this commandment. Love as Jesus loved. There's no other way around it. So every day for uh, the next month, I would stop by the room and talk to Benji and John, and I spent a couple of minutes with them. Eventually, Benji was transferred to a rehabilitation center where he could con continue his convalescence, and I assume now at, well, but put him about 49, close to 50 years old, he's been leading a normal life, worried about the things that 49-year-olds worry about. But John, before I left the hospital, John passed away from his illness. And, um, and that, was, that was hard um, because of that relationship between the two. So sometimes they, were, they would argue from time to time, but almost every day there was some laughter coming out of that room and I would stop by and they'd be playing a board game together and telling stories about their lives about the worlds they came from. Never again did they try to go after each other the way they did that first day. And I'm not sure they ever really came to like each other. Their worlds were so different and their situations were so different. But, but there were many times, as I said, that they found a way to connect. Neither one of them realized, but I believe that they met the Christ of the cross in that room over those months. The Christ whose love extended to giving up his life on this, uh, in this gruesome way on the cross. The Christ who commands his disciples to love one another whether they want to or not. And because, of, <clears throat> because they found this love between themselves and this way of life in the world, in spite of their differences, neither one of them would ever be the same. Because I knew Benji, I was changed. Because John knew Benji, I was changed. And because Benji knew John, he was changed. Never the same. And that's the power of this commandment. Amen. We continue now with some brief prayers. Conclude with these prayers. On this night, we have heard the Lord's command to love one another as he loved us. We have received God's love in Jesus Christ and are called to love one another, to be servants to each other as Jesus became our servant. Our commitment to this loving service is signified by Christ in the washing of feet, 
and it is the st- and it is strengthened as we receive the meal of life. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in a wonderful sacra- sacrament, you strengthen us with the saving power of your suffering and death and resurrection. May the presence of your risen body so work in us that the fruits of your redemption will show forth in the way that we live. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily, your, our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.